everyone, and welcome to another one of our interviews with subject matter experts and areas that you care about as you work with students and families. My name is Cindy McDonald, and I am your hostess for these interviews. And today I'm very excited to have with me Laura Young. She is the Director of Undergraduate, of Director of Enrollment Management at UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Cindy. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so we're glad to have you. This is, um, our, I teach for UCLA, so I'm glad to be talking to somebody who works at the school that, that I also am employed by. And tell us a little bit about your background and how did you come to be in admissions at the School of Arts and Architecture? Um, uh, by accident. Um, so kind of how, how I got into it was I was always very interested into visual and performing arts activities at a really early age. And I actually went to UCLA as an arts major just because I wanted to be around my people. Um, anybody who's creative, I just sort of gravitate towards. And making artistic work is kind of the way that I process life experiences. And I didn't want to do the gallery or museum hustle or anything like that. So I was kind of using college to explore. And I had a mentor in high school who encouraged me to kind of think beyond painting and drawing and playing the piano and impersonating celebrities. I did do some acting, but um, I'm more of a comedy improv person. And when I went to college, I was really conscious of how much I like to solve problems. I mean, if you give me a sticky wicket, I'm all over it. And my curiosity about people and things and really being comfortable in front of an audience. So towards the end of my sophomore year, I volunteered for an open house for admitted students, and I met my predecessors, and I thought, oh, like, so there's a job that you can have where you travel and you talk to creative students. Like, that's a cool job. So that's kind of how I ended up doing the work that I did. My, one of my predecessors announced that she was leaving. I said, who gets your job? I got her job, and um, now I'm 15 years in. So. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. that's, that's very exciting. And I think that's part of what um, oftentimes parents and counselors encounter is um, I just had this conversation, a similar conversation with a student today. I was like, well, what do you do with an interest in arts? Mm -hmm. So when I'm a counselor or an advisor and a student comes in to me and says, I want to study visual arts, what, what should I tell them as a counselor? Um, kind of two big questions that can get a lot of information and a conversation going from a student. Um, I like to ask them, like, are you making work? Because artwork, which at the high school level is usually drawing or painting, it can be made in class or at home, but knowing that the student is making work will indicate that they can put together a portfolio. So if the student has artwork and wants to use it in the admissions process, that opens up research to programs that accept portfolios. The other question that I will usually ask is, do you want an arts major or an arts school? Because you can find an arts major at a research university or a liberal arts school, either as a major or within a professional program, and then there are the standalone art schools. So if you've got a student, for instance, who likes other subjects or maybe wants to double major or minor, then a larger campus that has a wider range of majors might suit them better. If the student likes the idea of focusing in on an arts area and wants to be around their people, mm -hmm. like I walk across campus and everyone here is an arts major, then a standalone art school might be a good fit. I think that's a really good point. And oftentimes um, students or parents don't realize that the, there are those two options. Um, and how, how do they find out about those? Um, I mean, by just researching, because especially with the standalone art schools, uh, many of them are accredited by the National Association of Schools of Art and Design, um, so NASAD, or they're affiliated with ACAD, the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design, and those two organizations are a really good place to start that research on independent art schools. So I think especially for art schools, that accreditation is a really important um, piece to, to look at. Um, With standalone art schools, it can be really useful. Where it kind of falls off the map a little bit are strong arts programs that are at research universities or liberal arts institutions because they may or may not be NASAD accredited. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you can still look around. There are still very strong arts programs. And the reason that 
an arts program at a larger campus might not have specific accreditation is just because they're already accredited by a larger body or their arts programs might be influenced by the culture on the campus. Like, you know, MIT has a culture and technology program that is a really interesting arts program in visual culture, but isn't accredited by NASA. Mm -hmm. And most people wouldn't um, pair arts and technology, you know, think about that even being an option at MIT. Oh, that's a spicy, spicy area. <laughs> that is, that's so hot right now. So. Oh, I, I bet. Mm -hmm. Well, I find it interesting that UCLA, it's architecture and the arts. Why is, are the programs combined? Um, uh, politics from a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> we, used, we used to just be the UCLA School of Art, and then usually architecture programs are standalone schools, but we had to adopt them for various reasons. Okay. I don't really know why, but then, you know, they still wanted to have that there, so we became the School of the Arts and Architecture, kind of like how we also have a School of Theater, Film, and Television, mm -hmm. where typically mm -hmm. they're, in, like, usually they're standalone film programs at school, so it doesn't, it's just, just little silos and, and politics, and on-campus politics. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> like, I know the University of Cincinnati has mm -hmm. their architecture, but they also define it, decide, um, it's connected to design and you know art is something that's incorporated into so many different aspects of our lives and um, as you said technology is also a huge growing area yes so, so you mentioned portfolios and how students mm -hmm. should have portfolios what should they include in their portfolio so if a student wants to turn in a portfolio a school is always going to tell you what they want and what they don't want so researching, like looking at the school's website and finding out what exactly do I need to turn in is always the first step. That being said, there are two types of artwork that are really, really common for most portfolio requirements. The first kind is observational work. So you're, these are landscapes, portraits, still lives, anything represented from life and not a photograph. So we're talking a glass of water, apples in a bowl, your shoes, looking at yourself in a mirror. These are typically drawings or paintings and they can be anything from quick gestures or studies or more developed pieces, but they should be original works done from direct observation. And then the second category is personal work. This can be pretty much anything in any medium. So this category is more about showing off your ability to experiment and take risks with your ideas and your materials. So where's your imagination coming from? So if you have lots of examples of observational and personal work, you're going to be able to edit a portfolio for pretty much any school that you apply to. There might be some nuances here and there for schools with really specific programs like transportation design or fashion design, but when you edit the work, the editing is going to be key here. So you're not gonna put in all of your work into the portfolio, you're going to be assembling a portfolio for each school that has a very deliberate narr a deliberate narrative. So less is more. And it relates to what you want the school to know about you. Um, some other considerations with the portfolio is keeping a sketchbook. E every school will want to see finished, fully realized work, but some schools want to see your process and will ask to see sketchbooks. And then another aspect of the portfolio that some schools have is a home exam. So this is an assignment that where they, they give you an assignment and they want to see how you respond to it in a visual format. So this could be anything from make work about the color blue or create a self-portrait. There's no right answer here, only that a school wants to see your imagination at work. See your creative side. Mm -hmm. It's applied. Um, so you mentioned something less is more. And so adding, making 20,000, putting 20,000 things in, and that's an exaggeration, but you know, like 25 pages in a portfolio when they're only asking for five um, is not following the, is not necessarily gonna benefit the student, is that? Not necessarily. So, I mean, at this point, a lot of schools, most schools at this point are gonna be asking for digital uploads. So if they say 10, 10 files, you can only upload 10 files. Oh, okay. Some students try to kind of wiggle around this by putting multiple pieces of artwork inside a single image file. Mm -hmm. We know what you're doing. So <laughs> we see you. So, and also when you're looking at it, 
is if you're going to be putting sort of multiple images in a single file, are they related or are you just trying to cram in as much as possible? In which case, edit, because we, we see you. <laughs> so that brings up the question about, you know, talking about digital in this era of, um, you know, social media and all these digital files, you know, can they send a link to a website or, you know, things that they've posted on YouTube or things like that? Or are those also acceptable or is the more, um, you know, traditional um, approach more appropriate? I mean, many schools are, are offering the option to include links. So if students are using social media or websites to document and can curate their creativity for a wider audience, so specifically they have a website that is directed towards the general public outside of their friends and family, mm -hmm. then that can be an option if the school allows for a URL. So many schools will want to see work uploaded into a website specifically. Slide room is really common. Um, so for review purposes, they need to have it very uniform. But if a student is making more interactive or time-based work, you know, animation, um, game design, something that like we have to kind of go in and play with, then mm -hmm. schools will usually have a place where students can provide a link for the admission review. Oh, well, that's, that's exciting. And now, do you have more students come in as freshmen into, as, like in, in, in arts and visual arts in general, um, are there more freshmen coming in? Or I sometimes, as, as, as a counselor, I work with students, and they may not have found art or thought it was a viable yeah. major in the beginning and then want to transfer in. So do you find a, a larger number of one over the other, like freshmen over transfer students? Not particularly. I think we get, I mean, the, we get a lot of students. There are a lot of people who find art as freshmen, but I mean, students can come to the visual arts anytime that works for them. So some students are ready right out of high school and some aren't. Maybe they didn't feel ready. Maybe they were getting pressure from their families to like, don't major in the arts. <laughs> not sensible, which if you look at current economic information could not be farther from the truth. Um, but some students need more time and that's okay. They, you know, if they need time to mature, whether it's in community college or another four year, maybe they go to college for, you know, for undeclared and then they discover the art major and they go in later and then they can transfer around. Most art programs are happy to look at transfer students, in which case, if you have kind of a destination institution in mind, contact them and find out what their requirements are for transfer students. Oh, that's a really good idea, because that also gives them more time to develop their own artwork as well, yeah. because they might not have had that opportunity while they were in high school, mm -hmm. but as a transfer student, they might have that. So what, how is the timeline for a visual arts student on so their application? How is that different? Um, it's really not that much different. The, I mean, similar to applying to college, the earlier deadlines are around November-ish, and the later deadlines are around January, February, and some schools have rolling deadlines, so they'll have both, you know, fall, summer, spring admission cycles, so they'll have rolling. Um, something to be aware of is that sometimes schools will have two different deadlines, so they'll say, we want your academic information, sort of the nuts and bolts, at a certain date, and then the portfolio can come at a different date, mm -hmm. so I'm sure if the school has two different deadlines to keep track of those. Yeah, and I noticed that is definitely the case in the UCLA um, applications and the different supplements. So students need to definitely put those on their calendars and be aware because they're pretty strict deadlines for. Yeah, that's very typical you'll see of schools that are liberal arts campuses or research universities that have professional programs in the arts where there's sort of a main application to the school and then a supplement for the department. So you mentioned something about the current economics. So tell us a little bit more about that. And that's definitely one thing we talk about in our class is how really creative arts is becoming much more um, to the forefront of uh, what we're doing and society and economics. So share with us what, um, what the current economics tell. 
Well, I think that artists um, have been, and they're, we're trained to survive. And <laughs> to, we are. Um, I mean, especially kind of working within the United States, it can be quite challenging to be a working artist. So we've had a lot of practice at this point, and art schools have also had a lot of practice preparing their students. So it isn't about just being able to be a really good painter or a really good sculptor. You're learning how to hone your entrepreneurial skills. So there's always been kind of this perception as the artist of somebody who works outside of a nine to five as a negative, but really most artists, they like to work multiple jobs and they kind of like to work whenever they want to because it allows them to access their creativity at times that's more convenient for them and how it works for them. Um, some uh, website that can be really helpful for parents and for counselors and for teachers is the Strategic National Arts Alumni Project, um, SNAAP. So this is the only data set of its kind that looks at graduates of arts programs and shows how they choose their careers and how they behave in the marketplace. So it's really reassuring to be able to see how well arts graduates navigate uncertain economic terrain and how more often than not, they're really powerful entrepreneurs by nature. Like they, they know how to make money, they do. Well, and that brings up the point of what we're looking at, especially with the Generation Z and the gig economy. You know, many of the students are going to be going into an economic situation where they mm -hmm. won't have that solid nine to five. They are going to be their own personal entrepreneurs and have that opportunity to create their own jobs and, um, uh, you know, space and, and their lifestyle from that. So. Yeah. Um, and and then, you know, I always refer to the Daniel Pink books about, mm -hmm. you know, creativity and that's what the most important thing is. Um, it's all about communication and so much, especially um, digital in our media, is all visual. So anybody that can communicate through visual means in multimedia type um, areas is going to be definitely in demand yeah right? I mean we we absorb visual images immediately much more so than I mean the first thing usually over 90% of what we look at immediately is visual it isn't written you know it's not something you get to process it's just the snap decision and visual artists are the ones who know how what that responsibility is how to do it how to how to get people and I mean, that's an incredible amount of power and it's desirable. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, yeah. how do you engage on multiple platforms? So what other tips or words of advice would you recommend that we share with parents and students as counselors and advisors? Uh, for the students at this point, just, just make the work. Don't think about school, just make the work, make a lot of work. You have to make, good work, bad work, in between work, and maybe the bad, you know, bad is relative here because it might be that when you're putting together a portfolio, you have a not so favorite piece, but then it ends up really kind of developing out the narrative that you want in that portfolio. So just save and document everything. You're refining the work that you like in those directions and you're also experimenting with new techniques and concepts. So like think beyond school. You're making work that represents yourself and find a school that really supports and challenges you in your creative journey, which is a lot longer than four years. So, you know, trust that. Um, and then also for the students, keep up the academics. Uh, you don't have to have a 4.0, but if you are applying to bachelor's degrees programs, we're also going to be looking at your academics. If there's a portfolio that's going to drive the selection process, it's going to have significant weight. But academics also give us a lot of information about your success within an academic environment. And if you have solid academics and a solid portfolio, then that's when scholarships kick in. Ah, and that's a very that's a very good point because sometimes it's easy to think, oh, well, I'm, I'm an artist, so I don't have to worry about my academics or that science class or you know, those other aspects of school as well, so. Well, not as much, but if you can, if you have the capacity to balance all of that, then that will only serve you well in the admissions mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm.
Def definitely, definitely. Well, thank you very much, Laura. This has been very illuminating, and it certainly helps us in our roles as counselors and advisors to, to really encourage students and really have some answers for parents because they, you know, that's one of the things you hear so much is, well, what are you going to, excuse me, what are you going to do with an art degree? And now we have answers that we can give them. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is a small snippet, um, just I've been presenting at NACAC and WACAC on this material for a long time. And this information is whittled down from a three hour pre-conference. Mm -hmm. So if you have questions, <laughs> Cindy knows how to contact me if you need any more detail about anything. So that's definitely. And so if there are um, different presentations, if there's a schedule or um, something like that, especially as we go into the fall season, we'd definitely like to be able to share that. Yeah, just give me a heads up. Happy okay. to help. All right, thank you.